Welcome to Club E. Hi, I'm Rick Bremacolm of Bremacolm and Associates. I'm your architect of business growth and will work with, with you to unlock your potential and amplify the scale of your company. Today, we are discussing the director series board topics of today. We're on part six. The director series is insights from a professional board member, Sven Werwein, part two. And again, our goal of the director series is to support emerging and middle market companies and those in the business ecosystem to assist with their success. I want to thank our sponsors, Irish Titan, an e-commerce and web development firm, Highland Bank, a locally owned community bank, Romaine Berg, a digital marketing agency, Swegman, Lumberg, Woosner, an intellectual property law firm, and Voyager U, a way to build your independent work life. Participate today in the comments section. You must be in YouTube, but if you submit your question, we'll do our best to get to it. Also, you can watch and listen to Club E on our YouTube channel, as well as your favorite podcast platform. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's guests. Welcome Jim Zelke and Sven Werwein. Jim and Sven. Thanks. Good morning. Jim is founder and president of Cardinal Board Services and my co-host of the director series. And Sven is a professional board member currently sitting on four boards, three public and one private. Again, you can put your questions in the comments field of the YouTube channel, and we will do our best to weave them in. Hey, Sven, let's start with you. As this is part two of our interview, I want you to give the audience a quick refresher as to your background. Uh, went from accountant to investment banking, CFO, professional board member. Maybe just give everybody a, a quick overview. Yeah, Rick, thanks. Uh, glad to be with you again. Jim, good day. Good to see you. Um, we covered this last time, but Rick, but the arc of my career is as a finance uh, professional, as you indicated, CPA with Coopers and Librand back when there was a so-called big eight uh, in the accounting world. MBA, I spent uh, almost 10 years in New York working on Wall Street as an investment banker, came back to Minnesota where I had some roots, um, went, to the, went from the dark side as somewhat caught to being a CFO, and then the last period of time in my life and career as you point out, I've been on multiple boards today, three public and one private. All right. Well, thanks again for being here with us, Ben. Greatly appreciate it. I know our audience does as well. Um, hey, Jim, um, thanks again for being my co-host on this series. Why don't you remind everybody about your background and Cardinal Board Services, as well as the board recruitment work that you do? Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Sven. Good to see you again today. It's uh, so. so I am the founder and president of Cardinal Board Services based here in Minnesota. I have a partner in, down in Florida as well. And we've, been, we've had this company for 10 plus years and helped a lot of private, public, ESOP, family-owned business, did lots of different varieties, helping them recruit board members. And that's probably the best way to, to find out about what we do is just go to our website, which is cardinalboardservices.com. I've uh, been doing that for 10 years and have had another firm, Cardinal Mark, for 30 years. So it's been, uh, I've been in this area of the business for a long, long time. Well, great. Thanks again for uh, doing this with me, Jim. You bet. So Sven, you currently sit on three public, one private. In the past, you sat on others, you know, six other public boards, four other private boards and 10 nonprofits. You mentioned last session that you have over 70 years of public experience or uh, board experience. As you're, Look at you back in your career of 70 years, you know, what are the top three or five or two takeaways that you might have of, of serving on those boards? Uh, thank you. I, I, three's a good number. So let's go with three. How's that? <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, first, I would say, and I reflected on this even this morning as I walked around like, here it, do the work and be someone that people can count on. It's so important to, to not be a director that, what, fails in his duties. Uh, the second thing I would seize upon and, and underscore is build relationships. Build relationships with fellow board members, build relationships with management. I, I would share with you that every company I've been involved with has had a crisis at one point or another. And in that crisis, relationships really matter. Relationships with management and relationships with fellow board members as you power through to the other side of the crisis. And then I struggled a little bit, Jim, with what should be my third uh, a bullet point for this one. And I, I, I'm gonna come back to a cliche and I'm not one who's a fan of cliches, 
But I have to tell you, look, all of us who've been, what, uh, working away for all these years, uh, we recognize that it's not just uh, our good looks and our good fortune, uh, our smarts. We've been really lucky along the way. And I've had more than my share of luck in the people I've dealt with, the companies that I've joined. So never, never, ever underestimate that piece of the quotient. Yeah. And we've all, we've all heard that the, the adage where, you know, luck is where hard work and preparation merge together. And I think that's hits on your first two is that it's, it's, it's that work and preparation that's going to make you be in the right spot. But I really like your, your, your thoughts about uh, building relationships and, and bring something to the table every single time that's right. being prepared. That, yeah. And again, to be a little bit playful with your follow up to my, even if you do the hard work, sometimes you're not lucky, right? Yeah. So, so if you look at people in this community or even nationally, luck has played a part in many of the careers of people that we admire and look up to. Right. Exactly. So, so the other part of it is then um, the most common question I get as a owning a board comp a board recruiting company is, you know, everybody, you know, at some executive level, feel like, you know, what I'd like to give back. I'd like to serve on a board. And it's always like, how do I go about doing that? Any advice that you might give for somebody that uh, to go on the path like you've gone on? Well, I guess I would turn the question back to you and say, uh, what's your advice? And, and perhaps you've done that in previous sessions. Um, so I, I would not claim to be an expert on this. Um, let's see, you're absolutely right. The supply outstrips the demand. There's a lot of people that would love to be on boards that are highly qualified for all sorts of reasons. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Boards are not growing in size. If anything, they're shrinking in size. And turnover is not that great, despite some of the uh, external pressures that boards are now feeling. So I, I guess drawing in my own experience, every board that I've been lucky enough to be part of has been through a networking kind of um, opportunity. And like all of us, you throw the pebble in the, in the pond, there's circles moving out. So some of my board opportunities have come from that first circle, people that I'm more familiar with, more intimate with, but some of my board opportunities have come from that third ring, but still, if you will, part of my network. So if I were to underscore one thing for most folks, it would be work the network, work the network. Uh, second, there are people like you in the search business, intermediaries. Um, you and I talked a few minutes ago about your business, but there's also obviously the big four search firms, Spencer Stewart, and it's ilk, and those firms are active in the search business. Now, they tend to work with larger companies. They tend to be focused on big company credentials. Um, so you may or may not be a fit uh, for, for what they're charged with doing. Um, the other element of this, of course, is um, not to be too irreverent, but if, if they're looking for a, uh, a financial person with a diverse background and you're a marketing superstar, it's a non-starter. Your, your profile is gonna find its way to the circular basket. It's not gonna be top of mind for them. So again, luck or timing matters. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that, that uh, if you're a CEO, you have a larger chance, a greater chance of being on a board. Boards still like and prefer to have at least one or two CEOs on their boards because the CEO is the person in most companies that has the widest lens on the business. He's seen or touched all functional areas, if you will. Now, most CEOs don't have the time. Uh, public company CEOs are constrained for how many other boards they can be on. So that world has changed a little bit. But again, if you were writing a, a memo to one of your kids, and they want to be a board member, well, tell them to be a CEO. I think that will improve, improve their odds. Um, the last thing, again, to, to be a little bit irreverent is, and I've said this to many a person who I've had coffee with, beg, borrow, or steal that first board. However you can do it, even if the board has perhaps a little hair, it is not a perfect situation, get on a board, claim that credential, it will make it so much easier to get the next one. Right. You know, thank, thank you. For a guy that didn't have an answer, that was really a well-complete answer. <laughs> hey, uh, Sven, on the um, kind of personal front, 
uh, when I think of you, um, think of your dedication to your exercise, and I've been um, uh, honored to be a part of those walks occasionally. The other part of your life that I've always respected is um, your ability to write. Your father had a significant career in the newspaper business. Uh, you had a magazine column for a number of years. Obviously, communication skills are in the DNA, but you've also honed your writing um, over the years. How have you done that, and how has your communication abilities benefited you as a board member? So uh, I'm very pleased you asked this question. Yes, my father was a working journalist for almost 60 years, started when he was a teenager and was still writing for the likes of The Economist in his 70s. He also won a Pulitzer Prize along the way. So um, I was raised in a house where words matter and journalism was honored. Um, my board work, uh, I believe that how you say something, to whom you say it, and when you say it can all matter. Um, let's see. I wrote this down, so I had to glance down for a second, but there's an old Mark Twain line. Better to keep your mouth shut and have people think you're a fool than open your mouth and confirm it. There you go. <laughs> uh, all of us would be served sometimes to count to 10, take measure of our words before we open our mouth. Uh, I can't tell you how many times, Rick, uh, I've left a meeting. I'm driving home to my home in South Minneapolis and I'm sort of pounding the steering wheel saying, you stupid son of a gun. Why did you ask that question? That was unnecessary. She just kept your mouth shut, Sven. So even with my experience, um, there are times when I what, get excited or when I um, am not tracking the conversation correctly and I blabber on. So knowing when to speak and how to speak is really important. Um, in that spirit, I was sharing with a friend one day the story I just told you about pounding the steering wheel. And she uh, reminded me of an old Buddhist, as she described it, Buddhist line, and it's three questions. Does the question need to be asked? Does the question asked need to be asked now? Do you need to ask the question? So while I've promoted the idea in our previous session of using the Socratic method to, to peel the onion back, to understand what's going on by asking questions, the counter to that is that Buddhist series of questions I just posed. Does the question need to be asked? Does the question need to be asked now? Does the question need to be asked by you? Great, that, that's a great answer. Danny. I, I think there's many ways that we can add value to a board. And sometimes not being the most vocal one is, is important too, isn't it? How about- Yeah, you can't, you can't be silent, right? Right, <laughs> right. It, it, you gotta participate, but uh, picking your spots, I guess, is, is part of the art. So, from your perspective, Sven, um, talk about, I wouldn't say the perfect, I'd say an ideal board, like the structure, like how many is a good number of directors, what kinds of experiences across it and diversity of those experiences, how about their geography or personalities, all of those pieces that go into making up a board, and you've seen a number of in your private and public days and nonprofits. If you took a step back and looked at that, saying ideally, 40 is too many on the board, but five is not enough for what some of those parts. T tell us what your thoughts are. So this is a potentially a very long answer, Jim. So I'll try and yeah. be concise because it, there's a lot packed into your question. Um, and, and I sort of, whoosh, how, what's an ideal board? It's a little bit like asking me what's an ideal piece of art. It, yeah. it depends a little bit on, on taste and background and everything else. That said, let's let's talk about some of the elements of your question. Mm -hmm. Size. Uh, I looked it up the other day. U.S. Bank uh, has 14 members on their board. Mm -hmm. So when I see that, I think, oh my gosh, you'd have to take a number to ask a question. You can't <laughs> have 14 people all trying to comment on the same issue, right? So I feel very lucky that I'm part of boards that are not that big. Uh, more typical board size would be seven, eight. There's an historical bias towards an odd number, but I would tell you in my experience, there's never been a vote four, three, or five, four. You don't need to have an odd number on your board. It, it feels good, but that's not how things work, right? Votes end up being 
largely votes of consensus. Um, that said, seven seems to be a, a what a sweet spot uh, for a lot of people. Uh, ideal board. Second point. I'm going to repeat the uh, the word I used at the outset: relationships. Uh, as part of what I do, I try to connect with board members outside of board meetings. Um, have lunch with a fellow board member. Get to know people. Uh, that I don't otherwise know. And that, now that's harder when you have out of town board members. So I, I, I don't say it's easy, but for folks here in town, um, at Proto Labs, for instance, a couple of years ago, I kept track back to the CPA gene. When did I last have lunch with board member X or board member Y? So I knew that I was in touch with those, with those folks. Uh, next part of that question, board composition. As we all know, as we all know, every board does the matrix game, skill sets on one axis, names on the other axis, and you look at, populate that matrix and see what skills might be missing. Do we have everything but a marketing person? Do we not have uh, a financial expert? Do we not have a former CEO? Back to a comment I made a few minutes ago. So the matrix is a crude but useful tool for identifying when there may be gaps. Now, one anecdote here, some years ago, I was on a board, and there was a board member who put an X in every one of the boxes. There was nothing. <laughs> there was nothing that they weren't an expert at, um, which of course created eye rolls among the rest of us. Um, so I, I'm going to to close my answer to your question. I'm going to uh, steal somebody else's metaphor. Uh, I read once that a good board is like a orchestra. Um, everybody picks up a different instrument and together you make great music. And, and I like that picture, right? Uh, an improvement on that metaphor would be that you're a jazz combo. Jazz combos don't necessarily have sheet music, right? They're not reading right. the notes. They're playing riffs and they're moving from one piece to another. And so uh, perhaps a good board is more like a jazz combo. You still need a leader. But everybody, whether it's the bass player or the or the guitar or the drum or whatever, they're, they're adding their own rhythm uh, to what you're doing. Excellent. That's an excellent one. Uh, how about you, Rick? You know, um, I agree with Sven on, on what he covered there. Just a couple of things to add. I'd say maybe generational, um, maybe some age difference across the board, um, maybe geography where they're coming from different parts of the country. And then uh, you can find it out there. I won't go into the whole thing, but I wrote a, um, a blog a while back on, on having an advisory board. And I was um, uh, focused on some birds that I had seen at my cabin last summer. So an eagle with a strategic uh, point of view, the owl with uh, thinking outside the box, the blue heron on being very efficient and correct with the stuff that they do, the blue jay bringing accountability and the hummingbird being somebody who sees a lot of things, gathers up a lot of opportunities and shares them. So, so yes, I uh, totally agree with Sven with the matrix. You just might look at their personalities and kind of that intangible thing they bring to the group beyond just what their title and professional experience is. Good. I, I, I lo love that, Rick, it's terrific. If I got a coda to what I said earlier on the geography point, I happen to believe there's real merit in having some of your board members be in the town where the company's headquartered. That networking, knowing who might be available for a job, I, I think there is benefit to having local board members. Now, occasionally do you need to get off the Minnesota island? Yes. And the boards that I've been part of have intentionally at times sought a West Coast director. But I also think, and I'm a Minnesota fan and chauvinist, that there's real merit in having local directors as well. Hey, uh, uh, Sven, um, if you uh, touch on a little bit, appreciate the whole uh, board diversity issue, um, a lot of focus on it these days. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts? Uh, board diversity is coming. Uh, you, your listeners may be familiar with the California law that mandates it for companies that are headquartered in California. The NASDAQ has floated the rule that you'll need to have board diversity. And if you don't, you'll have to explain why not. Uh, that rule's not yet uh, been uh, implemented. I believe it's awaiting uh, SEC review. But there's no question that board diversity is part of the conversation in every nominating and governing 
uh, governance committee uh, session. Uh, is it coming fast enough? I'll leave others to answer that question. I can tell you that the old crack about boards that they were pale, male, and stale is being overturned. Uh, boards are, in fact, changing. Um, so you're going to see a very different composition of boards, I believe, a couple years out. Uh, I, I would close my observations on this by saying that diversity covers a lot of things, as we know. It can cover gender. It can cover race. More recently, uh, pursuant to the NASDAQ and others, it could cover sexual uh, orientation. It could cover whether, in fact, you're a U.S. citizen or an international citizen. So it's, it's a multifaceted um, what label. Uh, I think we've seen it most uh, prominently in the first instance and on the gender side, but race is right behind. Hey, Jim, how about you as a board recruiter? What are your thoughts here and what are you seeing in the work and searches that you do? So uh, at least 50% of the searches that we do specifically call about out diversity, but I, I wanna make sure that we define diversity right, uh, at least as, from the board world. And uh, uh, so there's, in my mind, and what we've talked with our clients about, there's four pillars of diversity, gender, race, age, and geography. We've all talked about that just recently in our conversation here. But you know, to look at a board, uh, in, in a lot of the companies we work with might be a 100-year-old company. And so getting there is going to be more, uh, you know, just even checking off geography. Like um, you know, a local company we do work with here, they always ask for somebody not from Minnesota, even because they have half their board is from Minnesota. So they need the other half they want to be in the geography where they do business. That's a common thing. It's, but the, some of the, the legal aspects of it, uh, I think Sven made a really important notification is some places like California are mandating it. Illinois looked at that same type of thing. California did, didn't get through, uh, get passed last time, but it, it's gonna happen more and more. And it's lots of studies prove that a diverse board performs, the company performs better with a diverse board. But also we should be thinking not only about shareholders, but stakeholders. Look at your employees, look at your vendors, look at your suppliers um, and your customers. And you, you want to look, you want your board to look a little bit like them, who, who you're, who, so that all of them are thought of when you're planning your business. So it's, uh, it's here to stay. And it's just, it's just gonna, it's an evolution. We never have a revolution in American business. It's always an evolution. Yeah, Rick, one other data point here. Uh, Goldman Sachs, the probably most uh, what well-known investment bank, its yep. CEO, David Solomon, announced here in the last six months that Goldman Sachs would not take public a company that did not have diversity on its board. So mm -hmm. people are making decisions and uh, what? ensuring that, that the diversity thing is no longer idle conversation, but in fact is implemented. Yep. So Sven, I know you're a big sports fan and you understand the value of teamwork. Uh, what, are, what are some of the intangibles you think a board needs to, to be successful? Um, and then what about the opposite of that? What things get in the way of a successful board from a teamwork standpoint? Um, hmm. So it, it, can I restate that question, if you don't mind, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's see, what what makes for a really good board member? Can I can I tackle that question, yeah. perhaps? Uh, and given, as I allowed last time, given my predilection for word, wordplay and alliteration, I'm going to burden you guys with three E's. How's that? <laughs> um, and the first E is engaged. We've talked about this a couple of different ways, a couple of different times, yeah. but I think a really good board member is engaged. Um, just full stop. Yeah, I was trying to decide whether to add a, a, another phrase to that, but that does it. Uh, the, the second thing is a really good board member is effective. Again, we've touched on that before, um, but in moving the company from point A to point B, does she add value in a way that allows that to happen? And then a really good board member is experienced. Uh, it's the old line, if you're gonna have heart surgery, do you wanna to go to the guy that's done one or the guy that's done 10,000? Well, you probably wanna to go to the guy that's done 10,000. Right? So uh, if you can find board members that, that qualify for the three E's, engaged, experienced, and effective, I think that helps. And then 
I'm going to give you a mouthful of these because I'll give you two more. Uh, one is ethical, but that almost goes without saying. So that's motherhood and apple pie. But the other one is ego constrained. Now notice I don't say ego less because I think one needs to have an ego. You're in a room with, if not alpha males and alpha females, pretty close. And so to have no ego uh, would be what? Not the kind of profile you need. But you do need to have an ego that's constrained. You don't want to be one of these people that has to what strut around the room, if you will. So uh, I'm going to leave you with that uh, mouthful of ease. So uh, Sven, how about a good board meeting? What, uh, what does a good board meeting look like? Um, The first thing that comes to mind is that does the mansion avoid death by PowerPoint? <laughs> if, if you, it, we, we all get uh, through these board portals these days, uh, the board decks, if you will, in advance of the meeting. And you first open up a board portal and you see how many pages there are, right? What's your homework? How many, how many, how long to get through this deck? And if it's over 200 pages, your heart drops. Um, that's a lot of pages to, even if they're pictures and, and, and the like. So I, I think management teams need to work harder across the board. And again, in avoiding de uh, death by PowerPoint. If there are a lot of slides, speak to and comment only on a few. Don't try and um, what underscore every point. on. It's, it's just really hard that the board gets glassy eyed, the board, um, almost falls asleep in that situation. Uh, the second mark of a good board meeting, I think, is when the CEO runs the meeting. She's in charge. You want her to be in charge. But she also needs to let her uh, direct reports shine. So a good CEO, in my experience, will set the stage and then, if you will, step to the side of, of the stage and let her uh, direct reports carry the ball. Uh, that's really important. And then last, I suppose, is do all board members participate? Uh, why are you there if you're not part of the game? So there are board members that choose not to, or perhaps are, are uh, have a different style and they need to be encouraged to participate. But I, when you leave a board meeting, if you feel like everybody's been involved, there's just a, a, a warmer feeling around what just happened as opposed to if one or two people, what, seize the mic and never let go. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add there, um, I myself like to get the materials with enough time in advance so you can get through them, like the meetings to the extent possible, finish uh, on time if they can. I uh, totally agree with you, Sven, on your last point, and that was one of the ones I was going to say, is if the discussion is not balanced and you get a certain person or people talking too much, that it means that the other folks can't participate. Not everybody is as alpha or as extroverted, and sometimes people need a little space to chime in. So kind of uh, uh, an EQ around how the meeting is flowing and, and for everybody to participate. Uh, Jim, uh, anything you'd like to add there? Sure, I've got an analogy. So uh, it, it's, it's like driving a car. You want to if you want to spend the majority of your time looking out the windshield, not looking in the rearview mirror. If, if we spend too much of the board meeting, you reviewing the financials that are passed, nothing we can do about it, but just review them. And then, and then you tend to, you know, grind down to well, why did that happen? And why did this happen? Good to know, but at the same time, we spent excess time, a good board meeting, you're looking out the front of the windshield, talking about strategy opportunities, business at hand as well. I think the other piece of it, the other piece of it is we a good board meeting has a rhythm, and you typically have four to five bit meetings a year. You know, one should be on succession planning, one should be on, uh, you know, on forecast, one should be on compensation as a sub major topic of the board. But having a rhythm gets people that coming prepared on those particular topics. How about I said? Let me ask you this: the opposite. You know, think about a bad board meeting you've been in. Don't name names, but uh, think about when it doesn't go well. What, what's usually the reason why it doesn't go well? Two things uh, in response to your question. First is lack of pre preparation. If people show up and aren't ready. The second one is a little more uh, 
uh, nuanced. And so let me tell a story on myself first, if you don't mind, to set this up. So back when I was working in New York, as I allowed at the beginning, and I worked all weekend, worked all weekend, and we didn't have some of the tools and technologies that are available today. I'm, I'm old enough. And I came in on Monday with my blue suit and my striped tie and all the rest and went up to the managing director and gave him the book and he rifled through it and then looked at me and said, Sven, what do you think? And I burst into tears because I had worked so hard just to get him his bloody book that I didn't have any idea what I thought. And it's a good lesson. So no matter what you're doing, you need to develop a point of view. You need to distill the data down to what do you think? Now, fast forward to a board meeting. At the end of a board meeting, we often go around the room and ask, what do you think, Jim? Rick, what do you think? And if you as a board member have, don't have a point of view, one that perhaps you developed in advance, one that you developed during the meeting, it becomes very clear. So you're put on the spot on a particular issue, whether it's a personnel issue or a business issue, Sven, what do you think? And if I don't have an answer for that particular question, often coming from the chair, because the CEO has now left the room and we're just doing a board only executive session. If I don't have an answer, it, it's embarrassing, it's unprofessional, and it doesn't help move things forward. So think is an important message. Okay, great. You know, I, I, I would add to it is, you know, a chairman that doesn't act as a chairman board meetings tend to get a little bit unruly. You want a chairman that knows their knows why they've been elected the chairman and can manage the meeting to, to be on time, to, 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 to garner the, the conversation the right way. A good chairman can make a, a meeting go much better and a bad one, just the opposite, so. Ab absolutely, and, and by extension, good committee chairs as well. A board that doesn't have strong leadership is a board that's not doing its job. Yeah, Rick, and, how about weigh in on your, your thoughts? I uh, will start with what Sven started with, which is preparation. So if the board's prepared, um, you get off in the right direction. If they're not, things are going to go south. Uh, I'd finish with and alluded to it a little early, uh, earlier, the folks that talk too much. I also would say if you measured the amount of time that the uh, management was talking versus the board and it was too one-sided to the management, then there's not enough uh, dialogue and not enough discussion, not enough questions. So if there was a meter and it went back and forth, I'd want to see some balance between management talking and the board talking. Right. Right. Hey Sven, uh, you told me um, and have talked to others about this, about uh, your prep work and that you read the materials three times. First to get kind of a gist, uh, overall gist of the situation. Second one is to formulate some questions. And then the third one is to fill in some of the details. Does that adequately describe your pre-meeting work? It's what's worked for me. I, um, again, I'm not sure how much more to add because you did a nice job of summarizing that. Um, you really have to get a sense in the first instance what's there. Um, and then when you're done, you have to know what you think about certain things and perhaps have a handful of questions. So yes, for me, that's the rhythm. When I think about a weekend, when I'm gonna get ready for a board meeting the following week, that's typically what I'll do. I'll, I'll uh, do the quick survey says through the entire deck and then I'll go back and pick out pieces. But yes, uh, that's, that's how I approach the work. Well, you mentioned, uh, just to follow up on that, you mentioned a little bit about the meetings outside of the board meeting. Maybe talk a little bit about the rhythm that you try to have with other board members and or the management team. Uh, very good. Much of this has changed, of course, in the last year because we didn't share uh, what public spaces with each other. Um, but historically, what I tried to do is work on those relationships, uh, fellow board members, let's have lunch, let's have coffee. And of course, some of that is social time, learning about each other, building that connection, whether it's kids or politics or, or anything else. Uh, but then you touch on some board issues. Uh, similarly with the management team. In my case, as the audit committee chair, similarly with the controller. So I'm having lunch not in, again, normal times such as they were, not just with the CFO, but I'm dipping down to the next level 
to have a feel for what this person is about. Are they possibly, for instance, a, a successor to the to the incumbent CFO and so on and so forth. So I would underscore that I think that's part of the work and what one should do. So, so Sven, how about when you look at your, your board prep, uh, what's, what's an adequate time to get your board book and what's an unacceptable time to get your board book? Um, <laughs> good question uh, and nuanced answer in that if you're sympathetic and empathetic with the management team, even though they know the board schedule for the next year and they know right. they need to get material out, there's lots of pressures on those people, lots of things going on. So ideally you'd have a board book a week in advance. Right. And when I read about so-called big companies, which is not my bailiwick as you, as you know, it's often a week in advance. Um, my experience with emerging growth companies, it tends to be a little bit shorter than that. So you just have to recognize that's what it's gonna be. The board meeting's on Tuesday, you might get the board book on a Friday night, all right? You knew that your weekend was gonna be voted in part to reading that board material. So more is better, but again, insisting, demanding, expecting that it's always gonna be a week in advance is unrealistic. Yeah, so do you, do you ever in your preparation, do you ever, so there's a couple of questions or maybe some advanced to, to, tech to, to catch up with the CEO on, do you ever send email or ask a question beforehand because you can feel like the CEO could be better prepared for the, the meeting and, and things. Is, is that a common thing you do? Uh, I've done it more in the audit committee context, Jim. Okay. We talked last time about my mantra of no surprises. Yep. And so I, my, my goal is not to surprise the CFO by asking her a question or him a question that they hadn't thought about before. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't done that as much with CEOs and perhaps I should do more of it. Uh, I can think of a, a couple of times in the last three months that I've done that, however, we're just uh, in a low key way. So it's more like an FYI, it's not a demand. It's not in all caps. It doesn't have exclamation marks after it, but you send along a short message and say, here's a couple of things that I don't fully understand, or I hope we can spend more time on this and give somebody heads up. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not a game of gotcha. It's a game yeah. of working together to move the company's agenda ahead. So okay. again, to your point, I, I over time, I wish I'd done more of that with CEOs. I've been pretty consistent in doing that with CFOs. Okay, got it. So, so you spend 200 to 225 hours per year on for every board you serve on, I mean, that, obviously that's a lot of reading and Zooms and other interactions you have. You know, what kind of things should be dealt with ahead of the board meeting that so, so that your time in the boardroom is the most productive? And you've touched on a lot of it. Is there anything else that you think of to have the most productive time in the boardroom? Well, and Jim, you're a pro at this as well. So I would perhaps ask you to help answer your own question, but we touched last time on the importance of committees. Uh, there's an old line, the devil lurks in the details or the devil's in the details. So if you can push some of that heavy lifting, whether it's comp or audit or non-gov related into a committee, a committee that perhaps doesn't have a time constraint on it, that if they're gonna meet for an hour, great. If it takes two hours, that's also fine because there's not a board meeting immediately afterwards, for instance. So, in my experience, again, the stronger the committees, the stronger the leaders of the committees, the more work's done in the committees, and therefore you leave time in the board meeting for the work that's properly done at the board meeting. So do you think the, it's appropriate for you know, the finance committee or the, or the compensation committee to actually give a heads up to the other board meetings, not just make your report at the board meeting, but give a heads up to the other directors Hey, here's some things that we've uncovered. Here's some things we're going to cover in the meeting because uh, just just so you got a heads up before the meeting. Yes, let's see. In an era that's still litigious at times, you have to be careful about what you put in writing. You got to be thoughtful about that sometimes. And of course, yeah. there's minutes for committee meetings, as you know, that capture um, all that was covered in more or less detail. Um, I did have a fellow director years ago that wanted committee meeting minutes to be this. We met, we talked, we adjourned. Well, that's probably <laughs> not enough. Um, 
So the committee minutes, committee meeting minutes, that's a mouthful, need to be fulsome, but they don't need to capture everything that everybody said. Um, it, it, just again, speaking to the value of committees, this information is in proxy statements, so I'm not sure any state secrets. At Atricure, medical device company where I'm involved, we have the traditional three committees, audit, comp, and non-gov, but there's also two other committees. There's a finance and strategy committee, read M&A, and there's also a quality and compliance committee, medical device company. So there's actually five committees at Atricure, which is a north of $200 million business. It's not a billion dollar business. At SPS Commerce, there's four committees, the traditional three, and there's also a finance and strategy committee, which the board has decided in conjunction with management is an effective way to do some of that detailed work ahead of time outside of a board meeting, making sure that, that the due diligence that we're required to do is being done. A, uh, just a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to submit your questions, go into the comments field of the YouTube channel. We did have one question come in for you, Sven. Uh, Kathleen P., longtime uh, supporter and participant in Club E. Thanks, Kathleen, for your ongoing support and um, sharing your question with us today. Uh, Sven, she wanted to know, just on a personal basis, did you find either the public, the private, or the nonprofit boards to be kind of the most self-fulfilling or rewarding personally? Uh, uh, all the above, they're different strokes, right? Um, Rick, as you and I know, I served on the board of DLSL High School where my uh, three children went to high school, uh, Nickel Island. And so that had its own joys and, and gifts um, the mission work that DLSL does. Uh, the Loft Literary Center, where I was on the board, every board meeting began with a reading. And those readings were sometimes powerful. Everybody in the room would be crying because of the emotion and the um, power of the words. So I, I've loved that not-for-profit work. Uh, private companies, again, as we discussed last time, is very different because in a sense, you've got one client, um, the owner of the business. The public work, has been enormously interesting. Um, there's so many different things going on, whether it's stock price, competition, um, the financials themselves. So it's, a, it's really a multi-dimensional puzzle with lots of different um, uh, pushes and pulls. And therefore, it's very, very interesting to be part of that work. But it, would I choose one over the other? No, I think I've been very lucky that we're again to be part of all three world. Okay. Um, and then uh, actually, I'm going to tie that question into one more, uh, your, your comment about getting that first board um, any way you can, but you know, beg, borrow or steal. Um, what about the concept of getting a nonprofit board as a springboard to the others? Do you agree with that or, or not so much? Um, I don't think being a not-for-profit board with 30 other people, which is, would be typical for some of the what bigger not-for-profits, actually get you a board seat in a public company. Now, recall that my first response was networking, however. So perhaps in a not-for-profit context, you meet Mr. X or Ms. Y, and they're the head of the nominating governance committee at a company that, that is going to be looking for somebody of your profile. So building a network helps. But it's having, does having, if the question is a very narrow one, if is board experience on an not for profit qualify you to be on a for profit board? No. All right. So, another question that I've asked you before about conflicts of interest for board members and what was your experience dealing with that? <laughs> your simple answer was just don't do it. So, <laughs> no bad behavior, therefore, no conflict of interest. Talk about potential areas that board members could get themselves into trouble or be detrimental to their companies. Uh, again, a couple elements to your question, a couple elements to my answer. In a public company, your listeners may know that if there's a financial relationship over $120,000, it has to be disclosed in the proxy. So you get sunshine and transparency. So whether it's a board member's son or 
a executive son or, or daughter, uh, if there was those kind of relationships, they are disclosed to the public. And of course, they're reviewed by the board beforehand. So just because they exist doesn't make them bad, but it does require board review and it does require disclosure. Um, I've never been involved in a board where the CEO leases the buildings back to the company. I've never been involved in a board where the CEO owns an, owns an airplane and leases it back to the company. We've all seen those. And again, as long as they're disclosed, perhaps that's okay. So I've not had to deal with those kind of situations. I guess I would just bring us back to what is your primary legal obligation? It's a duty of loyalty and the duty of care. And any lawyer will tell you that time after time after time. So as a board member, duty of loyalty, duty of care, well, is a conflict of interest in conflict, in collision with those two first responsibilities. Uh, it's just simpler not to have them, um, is, is my short answer. Yep, I agree. But if you were the founder of the business, Rick, and you've got a couple of uh, really smart kids, founder of a business that was gone public, and one of your sons was part of the business, great. We just have to disclose it. it it's an important thing. I know when we, ever do, we do a search, one of the things that we ask the potential directors that we, we are recruiting says, do you know of any conflicts? And we also tell them if they work for a big company, you need to get this clear that you can even potentially be on the board. And it's usually through your um, general counsel or corporate secretary who holds those rights. And and so you need to get that checked out beforehand so that everyone doesn't go down this path that's not going to lead to something successful. But it but it is important to do the, the, the checks to see if there's a conflict of interest there anywhere. There. Some of this is just self-evident, uh, Rick. I'll use Atricure as an example. Atricure, public company, focused on the disease of atrial fibrillation, AFib. It would be silly for me as a board member to consider joining the board of another AFib company, sure. right? Shame on me for even, uh, what, bringing that forward. It, so it, it's those kind of examples that are easy to discuss. It's the ones that are washed in shades of gray, where maybe they have a little bit of an AFib business, but their primary business is something else. Now, what do you do? Yeah. How about Sven, is there, under what circumstance do you feel it's time to leave a board that you either you're making the decision or you can see it's probably time for Jim or Rick to leave the board? And give, give me your thoughts about when that when your time is up. Oof, that's a tough one because as we all know, as we all know, uh, on the one hand, uh, this is a very personal decision for a director. Uh, he mm -hmm. or she's put time and energy into a board for a long time. Um, they don't want to leave necessarily. On the other hand, the board perhaps needs refreshment. The board seat should not be viewed as academic uh, tenure, a sinecure for the rest of your life. But you have a tension between the aspirations of the individual and perhaps the aspirations of the board. And so that has to be worked with grace uh, by the nominating governance committee chair, or in some cases, the board chair to, to move things ahead. Um, I don't know that there's an easy way to do that. Some companies have solved it by having term limits. As we discussed last time, Valspar, when it was a public company, had a term limit. Don't see those very often. Much more prevalent are age limits. I've seen as high as 80. I've seen 75. I've seen 72. I've seen 70. So age limits force turnover. Um, is it a crude tool? Are you losing some valuable skills and institutional knowledge perhaps, but it is one way to manage that kind of, of uh, issue. Um, based on my reading, Jim, I don't think anybody's really figured this out because it, again, you have this, this terrible, uh, I'll say terrible, terrible tension sometimes between the aspirations of the individual and the needs of the board itself. Got it. How about you, Rick? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, it's been touching on a little bit there. There is a little bit of a natural progression. Sometimes folks get a little tired. They get a little maybe bored or things get a little stale. If you're serving a two or a three year term, you get to the end of that term, have a conversation and that might dictate which direction to go. But 
Um, I agree with Sven, which is, it's a hard thing. Assuming that, you know, there's no conflict or anything that maybe makes a suggestion that it's not the right time. Somebody is doing something different with their business than when they started um, or, or whatever. Uh, but Sven, you brought up uh, something else. What about uh, the uh, number of terms? What, what are your thoughts on that? And or, and or um, how many boards can somebody realistically be on and, and do what they need to do to serve those companies? A couple of different uh, elements to your question, Rick. Back to term limits. Again, I don't see term limits very often in public companies. Are there, are there going to be more of them perhaps, but it's not the tool du jour that I'm aware of. I would say in the not-for-profit world that I think term limits are very valuable and in fact are necessary. You don't want somebody being the chair of a not-for-profit board forever. In my experience, a typical term in a not-for-profit is three years and maybe you serve two terms. So a total of six years. And for a lot of people in a not-for-profit, a term limit actually is a good off-ramp. It means that they don't have to sign up forever. There's an actual natural beginning, middle, and an end. And when the end comes, you say, I've done good work and I'm gonna go do something else and you replace me on your not-for-profit board. So a not-for-profit without term limits probably has probably uh, recruiting people. Uh, the other part of your question is how many boards should one serve on? And I'm biased here because I serve on more than one. So I'll acknowledge that. I think there's real value in having people that serve on more than one board. I don't know how many times I've brought a good idea from company A to company B to company C and back around the horn. You learn things and even if the companies are in disparate industries as, as my, if you will, trio are, there are things you learn that you just haven't thought of before, but they're valuable and, and applicable to, to the next company. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited uh, that I'm on more than one board. I think board members who are on more than one board bring additional value. I would also offer this sort of anecdote. There are board training uh, tools around. They used to be in person offered by NACD and the like, uh, the local chapter or the national chapter. Stanford has a great board program that I went to a long, long time ago. If you're only on one board, you're gonna ask yourself, is it good use of my time to go study that and, and, and spend X dollars and Y days? Probably not. We're, we're rational actors to the extent that we want a return on our time. Frankly, somebody like me, where I've got uh, more than one board, I get a better return on my investment. So it's valuable to me to read the magazines, to read the journal, to read the times, uh, to listen to webcasts, because I know it's applicable in more than one spot. Again, there will be a point where I'll be on no boards and maybe there'll be a point before too long where I'll be on no boards. But until then, I, I just think there is value in, in people that see different stuff at different times, particularly as we deal with some of these things we've talked about, diversity, ESG, what are the trends in governance? A person who's in that flow is a more valuable board member. You know, I, uh... <clears throat> I have gone to the CEO and said, am I still adding value since we didn't do you know, board reviews and things like that? And it's, it takes courage to do that. As Sven says, you kind of like being on the board. You feel like you're adding value, but sometimes it's good to get feedback from, you know, from, from the people that uh, are running the company too. Are, am I bringing enough value for you? Um, am I pushing too hard? Whatever. That, that's, sometimes that's a hard thing to do. Jim, I read something recently where we should all find a really good friend, sit down with them and ask this question. What's the worst thing I do in a board meeting? Just tell me, don't, don't sugarcoat it. Don't, don't uh, uh, use code. Tell me where I'm really bad so that in fact, I can be a better director. I don't know that many of us do that. I know I haven't. Yeah. Well, I just wrote a, I just wrote a note, Sven. I'm going to try it. I'll tell you how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> Hey, um, let me jump in here. We're getting kind of close to the finish line. I'm gonna uh, maybe ask another question, maybe to uh, Sven and, and I'll get Jim your opinion on this one too. What advice would you give to a young executive who's going to join their very first board? Sven, let's start with you. Yeah, so you join a board. The first thing you have to decide is how much to talk. <laughs> 
you can because you don't want to talk too much because you're the newbie, you're the rookie. But if you don't talk at all, people are going to say, well, why did we add him or her to the board? So <laughs> you literally have a, a, a challenge um, in figuring out when and how to add value. So I, I, uh, I, I'm sympathetic with that. The other thing I would just say, say quickly and then back to Jim is we all carry now a supercomputer around in our pocket, right? Who would have thought? Uh, but I would still stress the importance of relationships. So if I'm a new board member, get to know your fellow board members. Jim, how about you? So I we just uh, finished some searches recently. There's a couple of favorite books I have from Amazon and I'll just forward that to the person saying, you've never been on a board before. Read these books, they're easy reads. And at least then you have a perspective to start with. Don't go in cold. Second thing is, and I, I encourage our clients to do this, but I encourage the candidate to ask about it is, how, how do you do board onboarding? Because, you know, go visit the companies in their production facility, whatever that is. Go under, go listen, look at old board books. Get yourself educated before the first board meeting you walk into, and it won't feel quite as foreign to you. And I'd maybe throw in there, do a little extra work on the industry. So if they're jumping across the industry, maybe come right. with a little bit of background on the industry. Uh, we did have a quick uh, question come in from the audience. So just a, a very short answer, kind of lightning round. Uh, what are your thoughts on board observers? Good, bad, or indifferent? Sven? Never seen it in a public company. In a private company, tolerable, but not ideal. Jim, how about you? I'm going to ask why they're there. Are they an investor? But so why are they there? Are they just reporting back to somebody else? It's not uncommon in private equity investments, uh, per se, in venture investments. But it's uh, it's not very common that we ever see that. Okay. And then uh, for both of you, um, kind of one key takeaway uh, that you'd like to leave our audience with today as we're um, on the top of the hour, Sven. Uh, what would you like the audience to bring with them from our talk today? Uh, Rick, we've covered so many different ideas. You and Jim do a great job with this program. What, what comes to mind is the idea of Friday night lights, Friday night football. Well, I'm going to fall back on a sports uh, picture. You only play football once a week. It's not like a baseball season, 162 games. You can't be up for all 162 games. But Friday night football, you better be up. You only play eight games, get yourself ready, get prepared, and uh, what? Be, be somebody everybody can count on. Jim? Well, that was what really well said. And that's what I look at when I go serve on boards or bring people in. Be a contributor. You be prepared and be a contributor because they only come around once a quarter or so. So, and then f find a way that uh, you, you can make a difference. You may not be the smartest, you may not be the most industry knowledgeable, but if you show up and bring value, you'll, you'll have done your, your good work. Okay, and I'd add again, referencing a blog I wrote a while back, uh, like the owl, if you're thinking outside the box, you're gonna add value. And like the blue jay, you bring some accountability, you are also going to add value. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for today, um, honor and a pleasure. Look forward to future interactions. Sven, again, thank you very much. Jim, thanks for being the co-host. Um, and look forward to, to more uh, talks on Clubby in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it a lot.